Okay, well, I think you have to go back a little bit in, you know, history to see where the whole subject has come from. And I mean, this subject grew out of, originally out of a sort of civil defense, civil protection movement, which in turn, you know, basically grew out of the Second World War, the idea of helping civilians in wartime. So the subjects really come from, let's say, an emergency saving lives perspective. Um, in the 70s, you know, since the 60s and 70s onwards, people have gradually been adding new perspectives onto that. So from, I mean, saving lives and doing basically response, we went into preparedness, which is not very imaginative, the idea that instead of just responding, I mean, prepared to respond. Then, you know, let's say the whole engineering and architectural community came into this and started looking at the physical vulnerability of buildings and structures. Um, the sociologists and economists came in and started looking at social and economic vulnerability. And then probably I would say, particularly since the 90s, we've been developing this more sort of, you know, holistic vision of risk as being a function of, you know, the hazard, the exposure, the vulnerability, etc. But the problem is, it's like we've been, it's been bolted onto a structure that was never designed to do risk management. So it's almost like, you know, you're putting very sophisticated engines and computers and systems into an old car that was designed 40 years ago. So however, however sophisticated the systems are, it's like you still have a, you know, an ambassador. It's like an ambassador with a new engine, a computer, a GPS, that at the end of the day is still an ambassador. So I think where we've got to is a situation where the structures that have been created, and it can be from the international level, which is you know UNISDR, down to the national you know disaster management offices or systems, most of which are still in like in India, like in home ministries. So it's almost again you know it's linked to police and army, etc., down to the you know provincial and and local level. I think we basically have sets of systems and sets of tools, and even a mentality but it's not fit for purpose to address risk. So that's why at this point in time, I think we cannot continue just to sort of incrementally add things on to this thing that doesn't work. We have to actually now have a fairly radical change in the way we're addressing the whole, the whole business. So that's, I think, one of the things we're trying to do um, in these three days and in this series of meetings we're, we're having is just try and sort of how we can how we can think through that change. And I think this what I like about this meeting is we have to start with the concepts because if we don't have a conceptual framework capable of supporting that change, anything else you do in terms of trying to redefine institutional responsibilities or legal instruments or whatever else, if it doesn't anything that flows from the wrong concepts by definition will be Will be, will be wrong. So I think this is really important. In terms of a future, um, I think we're in a com an incredibly challenging point in, in history because I think, you know, we say losses are going up and losses are realized risks. So it means that risks are going up whether we, you know, admit it or not. But <clears throat> most of the risk drivers and it's whether it's urbanization or ecosystem decline or climate change, um, or indeed, you know, governance and, and social conflict, I think we're at a kind of an inflection point in human history where these drivers are now going to just accelerate at a tremendous rate. So that means what I think we're doing here and what we have to do now has a sense of urgency, but it wouldn't necessarily have had 20 years ago or 30 years. So I think, personally, I think we've got about three, three to five years to actually make this right. And if we don't take advantage of that space, in five years' time, a lot of the things which we can still deal with now are going to really start spinning out of control. And so, you know, we won't be able to deal with them. So I think we're at a kind of a unique window of opportunity where we either, you know, seize this quite and make a, quite a radical change now. If we don't, you know, I really don't have a very optimistic um, vision of the future.
Yeah, I think it's, it's difficult and that's where, you know, a lot of people I think in Europe or the US um, haven't got it. I mean, I'm coming from, I'm kind of, my passport is a UK national, but I spent most of my life in Peru and my, my kids are Peruvian as my family's in Peru. So I go back there uh, regularly. I was, I was in December in Peru just with my family. And Peru is a bit like India. We've had like, um, what, 10 years of six, seven, eight percent economic growth after 20 or 30 years of stagnation, violence, hyperinflation, you name it. And it's like the first time in probably, you know, half a century that people have actually now got money in their pockets and are enjoying the benefits of eight years of growth. So there's a lot of what's, it, every time I come to India, because I was in Delhi a few weeks ago now in Bangalore, I can see the same thing in terms of the real estate bubble, yes. speculative housing development. People now, the middle class now can take out a loan, buy a new car, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's almost like I, I got the impression people have been almost like bewitched, hypnotized by kind of, you know, the benefits of neoliberal economic development. And it's very difficult. I mean, so my friends in Peru are people who work on climate change, disaster risk reduction, social development. But all of them at the moment are just, you know, sorry, I don't have time to talk about the fact that the glaciers are melting. I've got to go and pick up the keys to my new BMW because the bank just gave me a loan. So it's, it's I think in, in a context where we're still in a sense, like they say, hypnotized by these kind of like mirror images of, um, you know, the benefits of economic growth, it's gonna be quite difficult to actually get pol policy change to happen, even though the signs of what we're not dealing with, which is like Peru and India in that sense are very, we have si very, very similar problems. I mean, you, you know, whether it's glacier melt, water shortages, um, again, you know, un completely unmanaged um, urban development and urban expansion. At the moment, that it's difficult to get those issues onto the um, political agenda because people are really enjoying, um, you know, having some money. Yeah, I don't know why people feel left out. I don't feel left out. Um, I just think it's if people it's people who haven't wanted to engage with the climate change debate, they haven't engaged for whatever reason. But I also don't think the big issue is how to, how to merge. I think if we said, you know, the big challenge is how to merge DRR and climate change adaptation, I think we're missing the point. Mm. You know, the point has to be actually how both get merged into development. Because mm. really, we shouldn't even need to talk about climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. We should just be talking about the word development should automatically include both. And I think where we've got wrong is by, you know, we started off yeah. with development, then we had to invent sustainable development, then we had to invent disaster risk reduction, then we had to invent climate change adaptation. And each of these things is now look as well very autonomous sectors, but ultimately we really should just be using the word development, full stop. And unfortunately, you know, the international community has a responsibility for that because it continues to well, like right now, with the, you know, there's three completely separate frameworks being developed on SDGs, climate change, and on disaster risk reduction. So it doesn't help at all, because what happens nationally tends to mirror um, the international arrangements. I think having sustainable development goals without taking into account risk is a complete nonsense. Because, I mean, how on earth are we going to achieve any of these sustainable development goals? It's, it's not like, they, it's a, in some ways, it's almost like they're being developed in a kind of business as usual world when we're not in a business, business as usual world. Um, from a you know, conceptual perspective or how it should be, we should have risk and climate change adaptation integrated into every single goal. But I do agree with you know, what David Satterthwaite said yesterday, but I mean, just pragmatically and politically, we may have to just go for a separate goal because otherwise it may just, I mean, is one thing is mainstreaming, another thing is dissolving. It may just get sort of dissolved in and then forgotten.
the trouble with resilience is a bit like the word, you know, sustainable development. It's been people are using it in so many different ways, but it can mean either absolutely everything or nothing right now. And no one actually, a lot of people who keep saying, yeah, we follow the resilience agenda, or are you part of a resilience community or this? I don't think they even know what they're talking about. They don't know what, they don't even know how they're using the word. So that's not very helpful. So I personally think we should use it in quite a precise way. I mean, in as close as possible to its um, original meaning, which is really this idea of being able to absorb a shock and bounce back. If that's what it means, that's what we should use it for. And if we want to talk about something else, then let's use a different, different word. But if we use it in that sense, I mean, I think it still has a place in everything we're talking about, whether it's through social protection or insurance or, you know, the different instruments out there which can actually help people absorb shocks and, um, and bounce back. Well, the GAR 15 for us is like the three previous GARs were all thematic. So the first one we started off with like vulnerable communities and poverty was really focusing in on, on that sort of problem. Second one, we changed the focus and really looked at um, public investment. Um, so it's much more focused on governments and planning ministries and finance ministries. And this last one, the 2013 one, again, we shifted focus and looked at the private sector, which was this kind of big area no one had really looked at properly. This one, we decided deliberately, the 2015 one, it wouldn't have a thematic focus because we felt in 2015 it couldn't. So that's to be a much, this one will be a much more of a big picture gar. Uh, so what we want to do is, is really have a kind of a looking back section. Say, well, what really did happen under the 10 years of the HFA? I mean, as objectively as possible, what has been achieved and what's not been achieved. And we've actually, we've mobilized a, a huge number of people and institutions to actually do reviews for us. Um, and write papers on every single area, early warning, recovery, risk assessment, etc., in terms of what's moved forward and not. So I think that's something we have to take responsibility for, is being a, giving an objective picture of what's actually happened. We're just finishing this now global level, multi-hazard probabilistic risk model. Last time we just had we presented earthquake and wind, but we now have in it, you know, flood, tsunami, storm surge, drought, da da da. So that's going to give us, I think, a good, you know, probably the first ever picture of multi-hazard risk levels globally. So, so in a sense, that's like the past. This is the present. This is where we are. Right. And then what we get out of all these debates and discussions should be then a proposal in terms of well, these are the challenges and this is how we should move forward. And in a sense, what we will be almost like putting forward is then saying, well, this is therefore, you know, the future shape of HFA and how it should be measured and monitored and, and so on. So that's, that's what this GAR is. So for me, this one is the kind of the end of a cycle of GARs. Who knows what the future ones will look like, but it won't be with me, that's for sure, because <laughs> I'm, I'm bailing out after this one and going to do something else. Um, you know, I think most countries don't sort of advance in a linear way. They go through kind of leaps and bounds. And I think the last big leap and bound India went through was after the, you know, Arisa super cyclone in 99, um, the Gujarat earthquake in 2001. And that led to a lot of, you know, institutional change, creating institutions, structures, high powered task forces, laws, etc. My impression, I mean, this is just as an outsider without knowing the context very well, my impression is that that's kind of stayed like that and it hasn't really evolved that much since the early 2000s. So I think India, in my view, is ripe now for a sort of new wave of modernization of, its, of the way it deals with disaster risk. Now, whether it's going to take another big disaster or a couple of big, you, you know, because often these things get triggered by a large event. And sooner or later there will be another large event in India. We don't know what kind and where, but there will be. But maybe that will, you know, trigger an, a new wave, because I really think it's kind of the, the system is probably ripe for some change.